Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be seen when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Worship your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Worship your holy name. I will worship your holy name. The 
blood that cleanses every stain of sin shed for you. Drink and remember, he drained death's cup that all may enter in to receive the life of God. So we shall. Um, this is the Jesus Storybook Bible, and if you're following along, it's on page 200, Heaven Breaks Through. About the same time Jesus was born, another baby was born. His name was John, and God had a special job for him. John was going to get everyone ready for Jesus. The day John was born, his dad knew God's promise to Abraham was coming true. God was sending the rescuer. And he was so happy, he sang a song. I would sing this, but my voice isn't that good, so I'll just read it. <laughs> because God loves us with a never-stopping, never-giving-up, unbreaking, always-and-forever love, heaven is breaking through. He is sending us a light from heaven to shine on us like the sun, to shine on those who live in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So John grew up, and um, well, to tell you the truth, he was a bit unusual. He lived in the desert. He wore itchy, scratchy outfits made of camel hair. He had a big, big bushy beard and a long, long scraggly hair. And here's the oddest thing of all. He only ate locusts, short for big, creepy, cr crunchy grasshoppers, which he dipped in honey uh, to disguise the taste, probably. But God sent John to tell his people something important. Stop running away from God and run to him instead, John said. You need to be rescued. I have good news. The rescuer is coming. Make your hearts ready for him. Yes, get ready because your king is coming back for you. Great crowds listened to John. They were sorry they had sinned and they wanted to stop running away from God. They wanted to be rescued, so John baptized them, which means he plunged them in and out of the water, and it showed that they wanted to follow God and begin a new life. Well, one day, John was baptizing people in the Jordan River as usual when he looked up and saw a man walking down to the water's edge, and God spoke quietly to John, This is the one. Well, John's heart leapt. This was the moment he'd been waiting for all his life. 
look, John said, as Jesus came down into the water, but his voice came out as a whisper. He couldn't make it any louder. It was all he could do to even speak. The Lamb of God, God's best Lamb, who takes away the sin of the whole world. Will you baptize me too, Jesus asked. Who am I, John asked, to baptize you? It's what God wants me to do, Jesus said. So John baptized Jesus. Suddenly, it was as if someone had drawn back curtains in a dark room, as if heaven itself had opened because a beautiful light broke through the clouds and shone down onto Jesus, bathing him in gold. Beads of water glittered and sparkled like tiny diamonds in his hair, and a white dove flew down and gently rested on Jesus. And a voice came down from heaven. It was clear and strong and loud so everyone could hear. This is my own son, and I love him. I am very pleased with him, God said. Listen to him. Heaven had broken through, and the great rescue had begun. Good morning, Red Cedar. I uh, am looking forward to praying for us as we start a new year, but I also want to start off with an uh, announcement, uh, sort of an event uh, that will involve everyone from Red Cedar, even though I don't expect everyone to be at this event. Uh, you saw, uh, those of you who were here in person, saw the, the um, banner out there on the window about our sledding event on February 6th which is going to take place just up the road here, uh, up Meridian Road, uh, probably about a half a mile or so. And the reason this is not just a, an event, not just a family moment or whatever for those who, people who are into sledding, uh, it's much more than that. Uh, our plan all along was how could we think of some kind of uh, safe event that would get us out of our winter caves that would remind us that we're more than just who we are when we're isolated in our little bunkers. Um, that would be an event that we could not only come if we wanted a sled, but we could come if we didn't want a sled. We could enjoy hot dogs together. We could uh, enjoy the shelter. We could be outdoors for a little bit. We could connect with one another. But even more than that, we could invite others to that as well. Even if we weren't attending, we could let our, our neighbors, our coworkers, others know about this event too, because they're looking for the same kind of thing, a reminder that they're part of a, a bigger community, a reminder that there's more to life than the cave in which we're all sort of surviving in this winter. So even if you're not planning to attend, I really want to encourage you to be praying for this event on February 6th. It's much more than just a... Uh, a church social for a few people. Uh, it's something we long for the Lord to uh, show up at and do a great work at. So be praying for that February 6th. Um, and uh, there's a chance we'll have snow this year. Well, let me pray for us. Our Father, as we begin this new year, we come rejoicing. I personally come rejoicing for the strengths of this Red Cedar Church family, for the way they love and submit to your word week after week, year after year, decade after decade, for the way they know and believe in the sound teaching of your word. I come rejoicing for the gifts that are represented in this church, a heart for global missions, a ministry of biblical counseling, a strong and diverse elder and deacon team, dozens who serve with joy in this church, who serve in our music ministry, our technical ministry, administration, caring, teaching ministries that cover from six to 60 and beyond. Thank you for the multi-generational appreciation of each other in this church and for the generous financial giving. All of these we attribute ultimately to you. And we come rejoicing, not because a hard year is behind us, 
but because of the evidence that you have never left us in that year. Even when we couldn't see it, we know your promises are still coming true. The promise that we are part of your bride that stretches around this globe and throughout history, and that you are determined and have been determined once more to remove every blemish from this bride and prepare her for that glorious day when we will be married to you forever. You've kept that promise this past year. The promise also that we are part of the body of which you are the head, and therefore your church is ultimately under safe protection. The promise that we are the branch and you are the life-giving vine. The promise that we are part of a kingdom that cannot fail, that's conquering all other kingdoms, over which you are the king over all kings. All of that has been true this last year, and all of that will be true again this year. But we also come requesting. We come requesting humility in a time when everyone is right in their own eyes and not aware how much they need a king over whom to submit. We come requesting unity in a time when our country is polarized because of politics and your church is as as well, and we confess that to our own shame. And we ultimately come, Father, asking for compassion. As darkness and distraction intensify in our world, would you make us a people of compassion? We confess that we want to escape the messy calling of stepping into this darkness and the complexity of people's lives. We confess that we want to dismiss our opponents instead of seeing them as opportunities. Jesus, you were moved with compassion, so move us into long-term action. Help us see past the behaviors that offend us and the motives that we have no business judging to the lost and hurting hearts to see, as you did, sheep greatly in need of a shepherd. And so we look forward to another year of your great faithfulness, another year in which you increase the fame of your name. And we come to you confidently this morning in the only name that we can that of Jesus, our Savior and your Son. Amen. Okay. Good morning. Happy New Year. I've got quite an echo here. So, it's just me? I don't know, I don't know. I'm going to let the guys take care of it, though. But uh, it's nice to be with you. Let me get set up here. Look at that. Everything works. Everything works. Well, good morning. Here we are again, the first Sunday of a new year. Welcome to 2021. A dawn of a new hope, celebration of a new beginning, or... Something like that, I guess. I don't know. Megan and I were in Ohio for uh, New Year's Eve, and uh, I didn't make it till midnight. I went to bed around 1030, so I didn't see the New Year come in, but I did hear it come in. All the neighbors were outside and making lots of noise and shouting Happy New Year and so forth, and everybody hopes, I guess, that the coming year is going to be better than the previous one. Somehow it's going to be different. And I suppose in some ways that 2021 is going to be different. I don't know what the the coming year holds, but, you know, in in other ways, the coming year is going to be very similar to last year. I looked at a few headlines just this past week just to see, has 2021 already started off on a fresh note? Are we seeing new things that that we maybe haven't been seeing for some time? So just a few headlines to share with you. Um, the pandemic is still here, in case you didn't know. So that's, uh, that is nothing new. And uh, then we said, let's see, this was January 1st. There was another riot in Portland. So that seems to be pretty much the same thing as last year. And then uh, because I grew up in Ohio and uh, grew up rooting for the Buckeyes, it was nice to see this come out the other day. College football playoff affirms Ohio State's dominance over Michigan. So there you go. Uh, Wolverines just as bad uh, and probably will be in 2021. Although now we're seeing some rumors that Harbaugh might go to the Lions. So I'm sure that would make a big difference there. Um, 
But <laughs> who knows what the year is going to hold. But in all seriousness, in all seriousness, here's the, here's the question. When the average person wakes up on New Year's Day, what is it that they expect to be different? They went to bed on Thursday night and they wake up on Friday morning and guess what? All the same relationships they had are still there. All those broken relationships, any heartache that they had on Thursday night is probably still there on Friday morning. All the sickness and disease is still there. It's the same as last year. Nothing seems to have been corrected. Nothing seems to have been perfected. Nothing is settled. We face the same problems on Friday morning that we faced on Thursday night. So that got me to wondering, what would it actually look like to have a fresh start? What if a person could have a fresh start? You know, what if you could start all over again? That would truly be a cause for celebration, some, some, some cause for happiness. And this is exactly what the Bible promises us in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, right? It does not matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile. What matters is the new creation. And if you, if you could be a new creation, that would be like having New Year's Day in your heart. That would be something you would celebrate every day. And this is exactly what we find in the gospel. A new beginning in Christ, a new heart, a new start, a heart which has been, which has been cleansed by the blood of Christ and is being kept clean. And I, I know, I know that, that this, salvation is not just a one-time thing, right? There are deeper and deeper levels of faith that the, that the Lord is going to lead us into. So salvation is both a one-time event and it's a long-term process. But salvation is what we're going to find the Apostle Peter talking about in the scripture passage today. So if you have a Bible, we're going to look in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. There's a lot in Acts chapter 2, most of which I am not going to touch on. But we want to look at Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 32. I better read the ESV version to match what's going to be on the slides here. God has raised this Jesus to life. So what's happening here, right, is Peter is preaching this sermon. And the way, that I've, the way we're looking at this is we're kind of coming in at the tail end of the service. We showed up late for church. We're just getting the end of the sermon here. God has raised this Jesus to life, Peter says, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. What, uh, uh, what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? What shall we do? <laughs> what must we do to be saved? <laughs> Someone else has been cut to the heart. <laughs> this was, uh, so this is what they're asking. What must I do to be saved? That was the question of, uh, of the Philippian jailer, right? What must we do to be saved? And Paul and Silas knew exactly what to tell them. Deep down, I think that is a question in every human heart. What must we do to be saved? Uh, when the disciples heard this, uh, Jesus, when they heard Jesus talking, the disciples were greatly astonished, and they said, well, who then can be saved? Uh, Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Salvation is the issue of the day. 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, I have become all things to all men. Why? so that I might save some. The crowd asks Peter, what shall we do? These people are saying, he has just told them, this is your situation, and they are calling out, what shall we do? And Peter replies, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. How do you get saved? That's a good question for the first Sunday of the new year. How do you get saved? Well, you repent of your sins, and you are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. 
See, Peter gets right to the point here. He's not going to beat around the bush. The issue at stake is the salvation of human souls. And so Peter doesn't say to these people, hey, you know, you need more education. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, you know, you should read some self-improving book. He doesn't tell them to get involved in politics. He does not debate whether they should wear masks in public or who is to blame for global warming. He is not talking about any of the hot topics of the day. He is talking about the one issue that is more important than any other, which is salvation. Now, some of you could be watching this and saying, what is that guy talking about salvation? Salvation from what? What do you Christians mean by salvation? Well, that's a very difficult thing to answer in some ways. But in, in, in typically, when I'm talking about salvation, what I mean is a readiness for death, for eternity, a readiness to meet God, knowing in your heart this morning that if you were to draw your final breath, that you would be in the presence of the Lord forever that you would live eternally with your Savior, Jesus Christ. That's salvation. That, uh, that God, for the sake of Jesus Christ, saved your soul, and you are on your way to heaven. That's the bottom line. It's easy for us Christians uh, to, to get distracted from the message of salvation, to lose sight of these main goals. And some of this, some of this, some, there's, other, there's other goals which are also good things, right? I mean, we, we want to make the world a better place. I understand that. And praise God that we can participate with him in the restoration of creation. That is, that is very hard and wonderful to think about that that can happen. But man alive, these people are crying out to Peter, what shall we do to be saved? And the answer is pretty simple. Repent and be baptized. Everything else is a fringe benefit. Anyway, he said controversially, the main thing I want to discuss with you this morning is not this sermon that Peter preached, but this question. What became of those people that were saved that afternoon in Jerusalem? What, what happened to them? So they received Christ as their Savior. They've been born again by the Holy Spirit. The fire of God is burning brightly in their hearts. They, are, they have some sorrow over their sin. They have a newfound love for righteousness. They are filled with joy when they think of what God has done for them. They've made a permanent break from the past. They are a new creation. It's like New Year's Day in their hearts. What is God going to do with them? What is God's plan for nurturing the saved? What is his plan for their continued life in the Spirit? Well, we look down at verse 46. Every day... They continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with gladness and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So one thing we see is that they continued to meet together. That seems important. The author of Hebrews writes, Let us not neglect meeting together as some have made a habit, but let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. And then what do you make of this verse 47? The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Lord added to their number daily. So I had to look this up in some other versions. And in, particularly in older translations of the Bible, I've got my grandfather's Bible here that he used for many, many years. And uh, particularly in some of these older translations, it says the Lord added to the church those who were being saved. I don't know if that's necessarily a good translation or not, but that sense is definitely here and elsewhere in the New Testament, that, uh, that these people who got saved were added to some kind of a physical, growing community that met together. In short, a local church. And I think this is kind of interesting. Of all the institutions that the Lord could have added these people to, right? You've been saved, you're a new creation, what's he going to do with you? He adds them to the church, not to the Salvation Army, not to Compassion International. He doesn't add them to, to the American Family Association or the United Way. He adds new believers to the church. Forbes magazine came out uh, this past week with their list of the top 20 charities in America in 2020. Uh, now, that when they said the top 20 charities, they just ranked them by the amount of money that they brought in. And there's some good charities on this list, and some of you might support some of these charities. I'm not going to read them all, but uh, they're doing some good work in this country and around the world. I mean, you can just tell by this picture that these charities are doing good things. 
right? They're taking care of people, they're delivering food, cleaning up a slum, saving the gorillas. They're doing all kinds of great things in the world. And, and it might be a natural question to ask, if I am a Christian, why do I really need the local church? Can't I make a difference in this world through some other organization or just by myself? But the Lord did not take new believers and add them to some charitable organization. He added them to the church. And why? Why the church? You know, these days, for I think for a lot of people, the idea of the church is, at best, some hokey relic of our nation's past. And for other people, at worst, they see the church as complicit in some of the evils in society. And there could be some truth in that. But Jesus loved the church. There's a verse that is read at a lot of weddings. This is probably read at my wedding. I don't, I don't remember. Husbands, love your wives. The thing is, when this verse is read at weddings, the takeaway is always something like, hey, 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 man. You're supposed to love this woman, right? The way that Jesus loved the church. But then I was reading this verse this week. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Now, by the way, that's the last mention there's going to be of husbands. Now, all the rest of this is going to be why she, how Jesus loved the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any other such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Jesus loved the church. I think that's the takeaway from that verse, among other things. Sometimes I like to look at, uh, I don't know if you like to look at statistical studies on the state of the church or Christianity, but uh, I looked at a few of these this week. This is uh, increase in church dropouts between 2011 and 2019. Now, so you can say, what is a church dropout? In this particular study, they were looking at young people, so this is people under 30, who said that they grew up going to church. They actually identified themselves as Christians. They said they grew up going to church, but they have stopped attending church altogether once they passed the age of 30. So that was 59% uh, of, of people in 2011, and by 2019, it had risen to 64%. So two-thirds, two-thirds of all, we could call these people millennials, I guess, who grew up going to church no longer go to church at all. Now, don't read too much into this. It's actually a little bit more interesting than that. It's not that all of these people have rejected their faith. We're not saying that two-thirds of the, of the kids who grew up going to church are no longer Christians. Some of them have rejected their faith. But many of them are part of a larger and growing movement of young people who see no need as Christians to be part of a local church. They don't see church attendance in any way as important. Um, and of course, then uh, we, we wonder about how, how has the pandemic affected these trends. In 2020, uh, according to Barna, one-third of practicing Christians, that's all, all practicing Christians, a third of them have stopped attending church altogether. And that includes online. They just are not attending whatsoever, one-third. Uh, if you're under the age of 30, half. Half of all people under the age of 30, sorry, not all people, practicing Christians under the age of 30 have stopped attending any kind of church, online, in person, whatever, since March. You say, what is going to be the effect of this on churches in this country long term? Well, if you follow the trends over the next 18 months, 20% of U.S. churches will close permanently. One-fifth are going to close. And you say, is this a result of the pandemic? Maybe, maybe. I think in some ways the pandemic is just accelerating trends that have already existed. We've been seeing churches close for a long time. Do I believe that 20%, one out of five churches in this community is going to close in the next 18 months? Yeah, it's not, that hard to, it's not that hard to believe. And we would be naive. We would be naive to think that Red Cedar Church, as special as we are, is somehow immune from these larger cultural trends. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about the local church. What is it? Who is it? Where is it? And why is it relevant in 2021?
Well, in one sense, you could think about the true church. The true church is composed of all those who have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And these people, we have two things in common. They've repented of their sins, and they trust in Jesus as their Savior. So that's one. And two, they have surrendered their lives to Jesus' kingship, trusting him and only him fully as Lord. You know, when we do baptism services here, we always ask people, uh, what does it mean for Jesus to be your Savior? What does it mean for Jesus to be your King? And if Jesus is your Savior and he is your King, then you are part of the church. This is what binds all Christians together. This is what, this is what makes us all equal. It doesn't matter if we're rich or poor or if you're, if you're American or you're Chinese or you're Republican or you're a Democrat. Uh, that we, we've, we have this old phrase, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. The former prisoner, for that matter, the current prisoner, the successful businessman, the teenager, the third grader, all those who share these characteristics are part of the church. We are all one in him. Matthew 8, uh, 16, 18, this is Jesus speaking. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Who builds the church? Jesus does. That's right. Whose church is it? It's Jesus' church, right? I will build my church, he says. But the church is composed of people who have repented of their sins, surrendered their lives to Christ, and have pledged their allegiance to him. He does all the building. He builds the church, but he builds it out of us ordinary people. And if you have any experience at all with going to church in the past, you know that that can be kind of messy. But if you are born again, you are part of Jesus' church. He has added you. He is building the church with you. So that's the true church. It's composed of all believers. Church with a capital C. If you're saved, you belong to the true, true church. What about the local church? Is there any reason, if you are part of the true church, why do you still need to be part of the local church? I don't know. We've probably heard this. This is uh, just a couple of church uh, advertisements. I cut the names off the bottom of these next, uh, a couple of these pictures here because I don't want to identify any particular church. But this is, uh, this is uh, uh, you've probably heard this saying before, right? Don't go to church, be the church. Well, really? really? Don't go to church? Be the church? I, I understand what they're trying to say here. There's like an element of truth, but this seems to be only about half of the picture. Or I've seen this on social media during the pandemic. The church has never been closed. I, I know what they mean by that. But there's also something not quite right about this kind of sentiment. It's only half of the picture. In the New Testament, uh, the local church, we could think about this word ecclesia. There's some debate about whether it's good to translate this word as church or not. But it, it, the ecclesia was a gathering of citizens. It was called out of their homes into some public place for assembly. Anyway, we see this word ecclesia, which gets translated as church. We see this 23 times just in the book of Acts. The ecclesia is a specific physical group of worshipers. And there's a few reasons why we should gather. For singing songs, for prayer, for preaching and teaching of the word, for observing the ordinances, right? Taking communion. And the question could be, can you do these things on your own? Do you need other believers for these things? I know some of us are, uh, are independent-minded. Some of us chafe under any kind of authority. We like to march to the beat of our own drummer. And I know that... Uh, I think for men especially, maybe I'll just say for myself, as a man, I face a temptation to take a sort of lone ranger approach to Christianity. I think this is true of a lot of men. I can sing, I can pray, I can listen to teaching in my own home. I could participate in communion. And frankly, actually in 2020, a lot of us have been doing these things in our own homes. And... Uh, just as an aside, we owe an awful lot to Pastor Matt, to Jake. I mean, we don't want to embarrass people here, but those guys in the back, Peter, have just done a remarkable job of keeping the services going throughout this pandemic. And frankly, going to church requires sacrifice, especially now. I mean, you got to wear your masks. I'm looking at everybody out there wearing their mask. Where's the hand sanitizer? We've got to space out the chairs. There's no kids' classes. No shaking hands. There's no live music. And so physically going to church has been difficult. And actually we have more options than ever right now. Why don't you stay at home, right? This is a, this is a, this is a church that I've cut the label off. Go to church in your pajamas. Everybody's doing it. 
And we've done this before, right? We could stay home. We could live stream the service. We could watch it later. I could just skip it all together, right? No one's going to know. Uh, why, why would we make the sacrifice to trek all the way out here to Okemos and risk getting cold and wet and sick and mess up the weekend and go through all this COVID-19 rigmarole just to exchange some awkward greetings and sing some muffled songs? Why don't I just stay at home? Now, I want to be real clear. I don't want you to hear what I'm not saying. And I'm just going to talk to the people who are watching this at home right now. I understand there are people who have to stay at home right now. Uh, and, and praise the Lord that we live in an age where we have the technology that makes that possible, right? We're still live streaming this service because there's people who have to be at home. They, they, you've, you've got the people with health issues. We have people who are just protecting others, people whose jobs make it risky to come here. Uh, we have people who are sick, in quarantine, traveling, right? There are legitimate and necessary reasons, especially at this time, why you should be staying at home and watching this service. So don't hear this as some kind of a, I'm not trying to set up some kind of hierarchy of Christians here. But what I am saying is that just because something might be necessary doesn't mean it's something we should get used to. It's okay to lament the fact that we can't all be together this morning, right? It doesn't make it wrong, but it's still something that we can grieve over. And, uh, you know, frankly, as I look into this video camera and I think of some of the people that I have not physically seen in months, that actually makes me pretty sad. And it reminds me of when, when uh, Paul was leaving the elders uh, and, and, uh, and he says, when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed for them all. And there was much weeping on the part of them all. They embraced Paul. Paul's getting ready to go to Jerusalem, right? He's leaving the elders at this church. They embraced Paul and they kissed him being sorrowful most of all because of the word that he had spoken, that he would not see their face again. So Paul and these people in the, I think this was the Ephesian church, they were grieved over the fact that they were not going to be together. And likewise, I think we should long for the ecclesia. We should desire that, the gathering of God's people. So I'm going to close with three specific reasons why the local gathering of the church is important in 2021. Number one, Weekly fellowship, whether you're online, you're on site, you're involved in a regular weekly fellowship, reorients my love. I don't know about you, but every week my heart is bombarded with things to love. Uh, the classes I teach, my students, my research projects, my wife, my children, my bank account my sports teams. Each time I come to church, my heart gets recalibrated, usually in, in tiny ways that keep me facing Jesus. I don't know about you, I, I just cannot go very long without those kind of course corrections. And, and frankly, those course corrections, that recalibration that I get by regular attendance in church, that happens whether or not I feel like I got anything out of the service. You could walk out of here today and say, well, that, Edwards, that was just the most boring sermon. You don't feel like you got anything out of it. But God is reorienting your heart in small ways. You know, the, it's, it's, it's not really about meeting my immediate needs. Our hearts are like a field. And we're going to cultivate this field week after week, year after year, until eventually we're going to see growth in that field. The elder team has a vision for the next few years related to the idea of biblical wisdom. You're going to hear a lot about biblical wisdom. In fact, if you listened to Rick's sermon last week, he already gave you a preview of what's to come related to biblical wisdom. But one of the aspects of biblical wisdom is replacing secular habits with kingdom habits. What are kingdom habits? These are very simple things. Bible reading, participation in small group, corporate singing church attendance, and so forth. Uh, James K.A. Smith wrote this book, You Are What You Love, and he writes about your physical participation having consequences. Christian worship doesn't just dispense information. 
Rather, it is a Christ-centered, I like this phrase, it is a Christ-centered imagination station where we regularly undergo a ritual cleansing of the symbolic universes that we absorb elsewhere. You just absorb these things in the course of your week, and we come here and we get cleansed. Christian worship doesn't just teach us how to think, it teaches us how to love. And it does so by inviting us into the biblical story and implanting that story in our bones. Your habits will shape what you love. And what you love has a major influence on who you become. Number two, weekly participation in a local church allows me to participate in God's own ongoing work of grace in other people's lives. You show up here this morning. I wondered on the drive here this morning, I said to Megan, there's going to be less than 20 people here this morning. Not all this snow and first everybody's still traveling. And then look at all the people that are here. And then I'm sure there's all these people that are online. And I'm, I, so, I'm, so I'm, I was glad to be wrong about that. But it, it, this weekly fellowship allows me to participate in God's work in other people's lives. Even if it's just a smile or a wave from six feet away, people hearing you sing these muffled songs behind your mask, it manifests the presence of the Holy Spirit to all who have come. We represent an unseen God to one another. We're members of something bigger than ourselves, Christ's body here on earth. And for those of us that have been isolated at home all week for months due to this pandemic, just being able to see each other physically, on the Zoom Connect, just seeing each other gives us the strength to face another week on this planet. And then think about discipleship. Discipleship happens within the family of God, or what, what the uh, New Testament, we have this New Testament word, the oikos. I think I'm pronouncing that right, the oikos. That's a fun way to say it anyway. And, and this is the household of God. The oikos, so that's a little bit more than just your immediate family. It would also include, say, your, your neighbors, maybe the people you work with. You could think about it as your small group. It's a, it's a, it's a small community of people, your posse, if you want to use that phrase, so to speak. And it's within that oikos that Christian discipleship happens. Sure, there's a lot of Christian books out there. There's discipleship tools. There's sermons and podcasts and Bible studies. They're all good things. This can be really useful. But actually, biblical discipleship isn't something I can do by myself. It's not an individual activity. I've got to be involved in a community effort. So can, I, can you get discipled over Zoom? Sure. There's all kinds of platforms we can use. And, you know, our church should think about after this is all over, you know, and the pandemic hopefully is behind us. How can we use these technologies? How can we leverage them for discipleship? But discipleship requires proximity and it requires presence. I can't do it alone. I can't just do it digitally. For Paul, ongoing discipleship occurs in the ordinary life of a local church under the authority of godly men. This is why when he tells Timothy and Titus to appoint elders, they're not just elders who are going to teach, but they're going to model godliness to one another. That's one, of the way, that's one of the things we do when we show up each week. I love this book, Life Together by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. We must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. Interrupted by God. God will be constantly crossing our path, canceling our plans by sending us people with claims and petitions, interrupted by God. And if Christianity for us becomes an individual experience, I have left very little room for those kinds of divine interruptions. Fellowship in the local church reminds me I have joined God's family I must spend time each week with these people in this place. There, this, this kind of consistency leads to an abundance of caring relationships. It's not going to happen right away, right? It's not going to happen if you're hopping to a different church every few weeks. It happens when we do life together, when we support each other on our journeys, when we participate in the covenant family. And then finally, the third region, reason, right, why the local church is important we declare allegiance to the kingdom of God. Even with all its faults, and I recognize the church has some faults, even with all those faults, the church is a visible witness 
to the unseen reality of God's kingdom. Our presence on Sunday morning testifies to the fact that the invisible kingdom is more substantial, more long-lasting than any other institution in the world. The church will outlast the government. It's going to outlast Michigan State. It will outlast the Supreme Court. It's going to outlast this pandemic. The church will outlast all of the ugliness and the cruelty in this world because Jesus has promised that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And your participation here on Sunday morning testifies to the everlasting reality of the kingdom of God. You know that since the Garden of Eden, God has desired to dwell with his people. In the Old Testament, we see this dwelling in the garden. We see it in the tabernacle. We see it in the temple. And then at the very end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21, look, God's dwelling is with mankind, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. And I know that uh, I know every, every believer is like a little temple of the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit lives in us individually, even if we were scattered to the ends of the earth. And thank God that we're two or more gathered together, that Jesus is right there with them. But it is the church. It's the little local church with all of its flawed people where God's glory resides as we gather in the assembly of the king. When we gather for songs and prayer and teaching and giving and communion and so forth, I'm convinced that God reveals himself in unique ways that cannot happen in my private devotions. So, we're called to sacrifice. We're going to sacrifice our comfort. We're going to sacrifice our convenience and our time for the sake of joining together in worship with those who are being saved. And, and, and this sacrifice, this is what the Bible calls an easy yoke. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Regular participation in a church family requires sacrifice, but it means yielding to the Holy Spirit, giving up the notion that I am the Lord of my own life. So what's the conclusion? All right, so number one, the church is fundamentally a spiritual reality. We are united with Christ by his spirit, and it's that same spirit who unites us with each other. And that spiritual bond is unbreakable. It can't be broken by time, by space. It unites believers across history. And so whether you are here on site this morning, you're here online, you are and always will be the church. You are the blood-bought bride of Christ, and you're part of the spiritual family. And yet, while our unity is fundamentally spiritual, it's not just merely spiritual. There's something physical about it that matters. I mean, this is an interesting passage in 1 Timothy. If I delay, know how you ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So how, somehow there's a connection between the church and what he's about to say next. Great indeed is the mystery of godliness. He was manifest in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up into glory. This mystery of godliness, which defines the church in this passage, centers on Christ's physical incarnation, resurrection, his exaltation. Our physical gathering apparently matters. It's a spiritual reality, and yet it's also a physical reality. Or our first Thessalonians, we think about the church and the general resurrection, the church at its most glorious. What is it going to be like? The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, the voice of the archangel and the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we'll be always with the Lord. There is a tangible and physical communion to the everlasting church. But for now, on this side of eternity, this gathering, hybrid service, these people wearing masks, and some people having to stay home, 
This is a foretaste of an eternal, glorious future. We're going to enjoy it someday. I'm going to close with an old song. This is a song I often think about when I walk into church on Sunday mornings or when I just look around the room here at Red Cedar. Surely, I was going to sing this song, but you're not supposed to sing without a mask on, so I'm just going to read it to you. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the touch of angels' wings and see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I don't know if I buy the bit about hearing the touch of angels' wings, but this part about glory on each face. You look around this room. Behind each of these masks is someone in your family that you love, that is united to you in a way that transcends your physical reality. And you just look around and you say, there's glory on these faces. I see it. It's a new year, but the Lord is in this place. And my invitation to you in 2021, wherever you're at, if you're here, you're watching online around the world, commit yourself to the local church. Start meeting with your family this year. The Lord is still adding to the church all those who are being saved. Amen. And so today we celebrate that our Lord is a living Lord and that he's still working, that he's working right now today. Um, and because he lives forever, he's always interceding for us before the throne of our Father. And because of that, we have a sure and steady hope in Jesus. Because his body was broken for us, because his blood was shed for us, we're now his people. So if you've put your hope in Jesus as Savior and King, whether you're here on site or at home, I'd invite you to this table this morning. Um, if you're at home, go ahead and prepare uh, the bread and the cup. And if you're here on site, um, in just a moment after I pray, uh, please make your way forward to one of these two tables and we'll be serving the bread and you can uh, take one of the cups back to your spot and We'll be reflecting on the Word of God, and then uh, you can feel free to take the bread and the cup uh, on your own time, and then I'll come and lead us to close in prayer. So let me start by leading us in prayer. Father, thank you that Jesus is always working to build his church. Thank you that right now as we heard your word and now as we receive communion that jesus is the main one who is working and that he's blessing us and that we can receive this as a gift the body of jesus which uh, or the the bread which represents the broken body of jesus so that we could be made whole and the cup which represents the blood of jesus that brings us into a new relationship with you where we call you father we thank you for these things Lord, and we pray that you would minister to us and help us know you more through this time of communion. In Jesus' name, amen.
Father, we do not deserve to be before your very throne, but thank you that you have prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies. Thank you that Jesus is our life. Thank you that when Christ, who is our life, appears, we also will appear with him in glory. And so we say, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. And we say, worthy is the lamb who was slain. May you receive glory and honor through this week, through our lives, and by your provision for us, through your body and your blood. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand and join us in... Now unto the King eternal, unto the King immortal, unto the King invisible, the only wise God, the only wise God. Oh, unto the King be glory and honor, unto the King forever, unto Father God, thank you for creating your church. As we go forth, we join with those around the world, part of a reality that transcends even what we can see. Send us out into the world knowing that as your church, the gates of hell will not prevail against us. And bring us back here again next week in fellowship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Thank you Bob.